Okay, well, I'm embarrassed. I love Allison. Not because she said that stuff. I do love Allison. She survived the farm. Um, I try to prepare people for 20 dogs attacking you, you know, with titanium hips and three legs and one eye, and we, we rescue them, and they've been shot, hit, you name it. And, and were you prepared, Allison, when you drove up? But the boys loved it. They did love it. Um, it's a privilege to be here. It's always a privilege. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very, very, very grateful. I love this organization, um, and I just feel like some kind of blessing that I've been able to see it be birthed. And, uh, and Maria, this gorgeous thing. Have you all seen Maria? I mean, this is, I, I really mean it. She's one of the most beautiful women I have ever seen in my life. I told her she needs to get one of those cardboard cutouts and take a, and, and take a picture of herself like today and put it there. Um, in the bathroom so her husband can see her. And she kind of looked at me and I said, because I know you're just like me. My husband spent 20 years of our life only seeing me with my Clearasil and my hair up in a little knot or hot rollers. And he'd kind of go like, I wonder what she looks like during the day when other people see her. <laughs> so, um, so I said, does he see you look this beautiful? So um, I love these people. But anyway, let's jump right into this. Um, let me look at the clock because, as Allison knows, I'm horrible, horrible on time. I spend a lot of time meditating and a lot of time. I don't wear a watch. I haven't worn a watch for probably 18 or 20 years. Deepak Chopra took it off of me a long time ago. And uh, his challenge to me was, instead of controlling my life with a watch on the outside, he said that he challenged me to use an internal clock he calls Kairos and learn to manage your life from the inside out. And that was... Uh, quite a feat, I can tell you. It took a long time, but, uh, and, and I'm still a little bit there. Um, you know how that works. Close counts. Horseshoes, hand grenades, and time. Um, let's talk about change. Isn't it interesting what, what the time we're living in right now? Change is in the air, and, and it's kind of like some of us are sick of the word, and, um, and, but it's become just like an ocean wave. It's, it's like everywhere. Um, politics, it, you know, throw the old out on K Street. You know, the lobbyists were sick of them. Power to the people, all these other images. Um, also, technology. Um, I just left a technology meeting um, since we're launching our own television network, by the way. It's called the Mindful Living Network. And um, so I've had to be very involved in technology and hiring producers and other kinds of people recently. And um, here I am talking about DVD production. For all of you who are planning to do DVDs or invest a lot of money, you may want to rethink it. Um, they'll be obsolete in two to three years. We're talking about holographic crystals and changes that are really beyond our imagination. It's very cool, very exciting, very edgy. Hollywood, I just left some screenwriters because I had written a screenplay and was talking to them, and, you know, they just got back from strike. And, and they were talking about the future of the Internet and movies on the Internet and on demand and, and all this other stuff. Their whole life is turned upside down. I mean, I talked to the guy who wrote Shrek. He wrote Shrek, what is it, one, two, and three, and all these amazing people almost welling up with tears going, my life is over. And, and so it's an interesting change time that we're in science. Um, did you all see the man interviewed, the scientist who did the first human cloning? Anybody see it? Did you watch the interview, one of those interviews? He sat there and he said he put the cells in the Petri dishes. And, um, and I happen to go to, the, I go to this think tank with these two guys that actually unraveled the genome. This would be back in, in uh, 2000. And they're very humble guys, you guys, and, and very, what do I want to say, cautious about the future and ethics of all this thing. So fast forward to this year when the guy took the four Petri dishes, he took stem cells and put his gene on these four Petri dishes. He said he sat there and he watched them start to grow and they started doing slides and he realized that there were four identical people like himself. And he said it was the most terrifying, awesome, confusing second in his life when he realized where we are right now. So my point is, is about change. Also our precious environment, whether you like it or don't like it or like what's going on about the awareness of the global environment, it's the truth. And we have to realize that every single thing that we drink Every single thing that we flush, every single thing that we do has an imprint. And I think that's not bad. I knew that a long time ago when I was loading the dishwasher. Okay, this may be big news to everybody, but I remember seeing my kids use five glasses a day. Anybody else in this? And I'd go, I wonder who's going to clean that up. So I think it's really enlightening and it's amazing time. But here's the other side 
of all this change in every area. Look at the kids. Anybody turn on TV this morning, Today Show, in uh, 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 Waycross, Georgia, the eight, nine, ten-year-old that plotted to kill their teacher? Yeah, took a knife to school and the club and the duct tape. And I'm telling you, change. It's an amazing time. And all I want to do is tell you, every one of those changes, as great as they are or phenomenal, it has effect. On, it has a direct effect on your brain. It has an, a, a, an incredible effect on the stress level. We are meant to accommodate change. It's, it's one of those survival things. It's a Darwinistic thing. It's, and it's quite amazing, and it's quite miraculous. But on the other side of the coin, we were only created to experience so much change at a time in so much of a rhythm. So instead of, I compare it like going 55 miles an hour with a speed limit sign, that's what we were kind of created for our brain, our circadian rhythm and everything. And we pushed the pedal to 55, then to 65, then to 75, 85, 95. So the world is not going to slow down. It's going to get faster and faster and faster. Um, I happen to be married to a scientist, and my daughter happens to be a, a, a physician and a scientist also. Every time we're all together, it's always about what's happening in the next five to ten years. So here's the deal. That's why um, this own your life and own your happiness that uh, the genius of Allison uh, and Maria have, have created here is you're going to have to own your life because the world's not going to give it to you anymore. Okay? And you're going to have to take charge of it, take responsibility for it. And that's why this conference, I think, is so important. So when we talk about owning your happiness or owning your life, only you are going to be able to do that. Now, I was here last year and since then um, have tra traversed all over, literally, every continent, um, being the global spokesperson for Unilever, all over the world. And um, this is really interesting. A huge bunch of my major audience, of course, is women probably the ages of 25 to 65. So I get to go all over the world. I thought all of this, before I started working with Unilever, I thought it was a Western phenomenon, our stress, our anxiety, our depression, all these things. I've got news for you. Whether I was in Paris, Barcelona, Singapore, it doesn't matter where you are around the world, it's a world phenomenon. The World Health Organization has said by 2020, right now it's the second leading, stress is the, and depression are the second leading cause of disability in the world. And by 2020, it'll be the number one. It's just absolutely amazing. So I keep going around the world listening, because I only talk for like, believe it or not, I only talk for about an hour. But then I get to listen for hours and, and meet with people. And it's just amazing to absorb what's going on. The good news about that, we're not alone. This is a global phenomenon. But I want to tell you what I noticed this last year, since last year um, doing this conference. Whether I was at Smith, College. Do you know what that is? It's a woman's college. Most of you guys know it's a great college. Um, up north, an Ivy League school. I did recently did a big conference up there, and, and these women were from places like the CIA, NASA. These were head engineers, Rayathon. Uh, people um, in engineering, technology, science. These are women at the top of their game. All the way from them to women like you that own businesses, to, to moms in L.A., to whatever, guess what theme kept coming up as I was listening in the last year? Of all the questions I'd get in the pieces of paper that I would, or the emails that I would get, or the confidential times I would spend with them, and especially, I'm not going to point out any, I just left D.C. and did a big thing up there uh, two months ago. I'm being honest. Guess what it is? It doesn't matter if they have a Ph.D., an M.D., Ph.D., doesn't matter if they're home washing diapers. Women, we're losing our confidence. It was the one thing that kept going up. How do I have confidence? What happened to my confidence? I don't have confidence anymore. I'm sitting there listening to this word come up. And again, somebody like me, um, for all the years I railed at my mother for sending me to the Catholic school because I was always the girl that was in trouble. And uh, they thought that would surely straighten me out. <laughs> her novenas and her rosaries didn't work, so my God, she's going to Catholic school. Um, and, and, you know, she's wearing a uniform because it'll keep her straight. Um, but I was one of those kids that, you know, let my knee socks rot off so I didn't have any feet. So I'd just put on, like, leggings every day and uh, planted seeds in the hem of my uh, skirt and would water it, and I'd have vines hanging out of my skirt. So I, I was an anarchist. I tried to get back any way that I possibly could. The nuns loved me. Um, but in saying that, I learned a lot of Latin. And so think about the word confidence. This is very important. Con means with fidence. Those of you in finance know this. I'm, my background's finance and accounting. Is um, 
fiduciary, trust, confidence with trust. What happened? Why don't we trust ourselves? We're women. What happened? What happened to the fracture inside of us? Is it because we're trying to be, and these are questions I'm asking myself for my next book, is um, have we, uh, you know, are we trying to be everything? Is it trying to be, are we trying to be everything for everybody? So in coming here today, I wanted to synthesize um, probably over the last year some of the greatest minds and hearts in the world that I've ever experienced, very blessed, of women. And what I noticed, these are amazing observations, I think, that if we're going to talk about owning your life and we're going to talk about owning your happiness, first we're going to talk about the poisons. First we're going to talk about what we women do to sabotage our happiness and owning our lives. Number one is guilt. I know every one of you, um, if you're a woman, you feel guilt. And now if you have children, you can ratchet that up about a thousand percent. <laughs> if you're married, eh, you know, depends. You know, what kind, of, what kind of guy you got. But, uh, and it work. So, so here, think about it. You know, um, I, I, my daughter came home. Again, she, she's a critical care doctor. And I thought, well, God, you know, she's in her 30s now and she's real cool. She was just here over Easter weekend and she started, we're sitting there eating mashed potatoes. I picked everything, picked it, you know, fixed everything she wants. She looks at me and she goes, you know, Mom, I love you, but uh, one of my memories is, you know, I was always the last kid in the carpool line to be picked up. Anybody? Anybody forget to pick up their kids or you're late, right? And so I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I, I paid for Duke. You know, you went to Georgetown. You did everything. And she went, she's stirring her mashed potatoes going, do you know what it was like sitting there by myself on the staff? <laughs> and she said, and even when the other kids were there, I'd go, they'd laugh at me and go, is your mother, does, and one kid used to say, does she even know what your name is? <laughs> and, and the joke about that was, was, I really, sometimes in the morning, couldn't read. I only have two kids. But it was a challenge. But maybe it was because I had ten dogs, too. I don't know. But I would look at them, and we have a joke in our house about them having to have plastic surgery with stickums on their forehead, you know, remembering their names. Elizabeth, Brittany, Elizabeth, Brittany. But, but my point is, is that, that I, the cool thing is I want to tell you, I've been working on this since I've been hearing this in the last year, and working about what tips can I give people to not have it. How about buying frozen food? How about putting stofers in the oven at night? How about using your microwave? How about whatever? We can feel guilty spending time. How about time with your kids? How about time with your spouse, time with your family? We feel guilty about everything. And it, it eats up your life. It's a cancer. It is the most ravaging thing that I know. Um, there is not enough of us to go around. Guilt is, has the most to toxic effect I know on self-esteem and confidence. It is literally eats your life up. So here, before we leave the guilt thing, I want to tell you, this is how you handle it. Now, and it's good if you have a friend, get a buddy or a partner, or, or even your spouse. They're good at this too. Mm, some men are, some men aren't. But, you know, because my husband's never felt guilty about a thing in his life, so he's a real, he's not a good partner. Um, my, my Catholic mother's a very good partner. <laughs> She's the best. Um, and so what you do is get yourself a partner, and then when you start feeling guilty, um, first try it yourself and see if you can do it with yourself. Um, like driving your kid and then looking at the look that they look at you as you're driving away, from, leaving them at school and going, uh, uh, they're going to be a serial murderer, I know this. <laughs> or, or she's going to have an eating disorder, I know, because what I packed in her lunch just wasn't right. Or, you know, or they go to bed and, and you turn on the television and see a study that if your children have red hair and freckles on the left side, they will, you know, do so and so. So what you do is the minute it starts happening, it's going to happen the first time, stop it and, and kind of laugh and go, <laughs> that's guilt. I'm not going to have anything to do with it. Memorize a positive affirmation like I'm strong, I'm beautiful, I'm loving, I am joy. Not that I feel joy, I am joy. Okay? And what we know, the science tells us um, about positive affirmations, we've got some good studies, great studies on positive affirmations. Do you know that when you say a positive affirmation that you actually produce as much as 50 to 80 percent less stress response, less cortisol, less chemical response to stress? In the same thing, I thought, if, it, if we know that with stress, and we know it with depression, why don't we use it with some of these bad little habits that we have? Because think about it, what's guilt going to do for you? Seriously, driving away, 30 minutes in the car, 10 minutes, thinking about what your child's going to do. What's it going to do? Nothing. By the way, working with uh, Unilever, I've got some good news for those of us that um, my other daughter had to remind me that Monday night we had double cheeseburgers at McDonald's every week. <laughs> okay? 
she's like sitting there stirring her potatoes going, you know what? Did you know we ate at McDonald's on Monday night, Dad, when you were gone on Monday nights? Mom took us there every Monday. So whatever they try to do, catch it, you know, and, and say something to yourself like, I am woman, watch me grow, or whatever. I don't care, you know. I have, you know, halitosis. I don't care what it is. But say, try to say something nice to yourself, and, and guess what? After you do it, and, and, and just take a week and say, this is, I'm going to handle it this week. Don't, don't work on one other thing because guilt is huge. And for that whole week, and it's pretty cool because then once you see what this monster is, you really start to change the way you carry yourself. And let me tell you something about your business. Let me tell you something about your marriage and the kind of parenting you're going to be able to do. When the guilt leaves, this power comes in you, and your family doesn't even know what you're doing, but everything changes. I'm serious. Our marriage changed. My relationship with my daughter and my – I can't tell you how it changed profoundly. And they didn't even know what I was doing. There's an energy with it. And I want to tell you, the more we're studying at MIT, Harvard Physics Labs, um, Caltech, we are actually studying that when people are in certain emotional conditions or having certain thoughts, actually it's like a tornado going from a class five to a class one. It sucks the life out of you, sucks the energy out of you. So um, think about this every time you have guilt. Okay, so that's number one. Two, worry. Okay, I know nobody in here worries. <laughs> we women, we don't worry. Because <laughs> if we're not feeling guilty, we're worrying about feeling guilty. Um, <laughs> we literally worry ourselves sick. Worry, con listen, and I've got to tell you, we have studies on this now. We're actually getting research on worry. Worry makes you ineffective. You're less productive at home, at work. It even decreases your memory, your vocabulary. Um, it destroys your happiness and can destroy your life. And how I tell people is to imagine it like a little tornado that starts in the Midwest and it's a class one and it picks up a little stuff, then it goes to a two and goes through Missouri, three and it hits Tennessee, four and it gets bigger. That is exactly what worry does. It's ridiculous and it gets bigger. It takes more of your life. And here's the other thing. It takes the life of the people you love and the people you work with. So worry, what does it do? Has worry ever solved any problems? Let's be honest, guys. I mean, how old is everybody in here? Anybody over 15? Yeah, the, the, seriously, think, if anybody can, I want you to jump up right now. Has, any, has worry helped any single thing that anybody's ever done? And I want you to think about worry. Worry is, I, I, to think of it like an SUV with rearview mirrors. Worry is either living, looking in the rearview mirror, and if you keep staring in the rearview mirror, you're going to get in an accident and you're going to take out things. And then if you take that off, the other thing is you're worried about the future. And it is absolutely, um, I was with a theologian recently, an amazing, amazing person. And he said, you know, the sad thing after doing pastoral care for probably 35 years, I have seen worry rob especially women of their lives. They couldn't smell their children's hair. They couldn't look into their kids' eyes. They couldn't look at their beautiful bodies. They couldn't smell the salt water. They couldn't feel the water on them in the shower in the morning because they got in the shower going, do I have enough bologna for that sandwich for, for when I pack those lunches? <laughs> did, I have a, did I take that blouse to the dry cleaners? Do I have that to wear to work today? I mean, you know, that's what we do. So this is all about becoming more mindful. And let me t give you some tips about worry. Now, don't handle worry and guilt in the same week because it's too much. <laughs> You get the guilt week, and then you take worry later. Um, this is what to do. Make a worry list. And I mean it. Write down. Write down what you're worried about. When I was started my company and I left the farm, which Allison talked about going to, I decided that I had to borrow money against my farm because I was not going to um, let, you know, I didn't want my husband. I didn't want any, any men involved in my financing. I wanted to do it myself, and I owned the farm. So I said, you know, I believe in my mission, so I'm going to borrow money against my farm. So what I worried about? I couldn't sleep for two days. I worried about being poor. I grew up not with not much. So it brought up all my issues. I'm going to be poor. I know it. And then my worry would be, let me think. I know how to cook fried potatoes, mashed potatoes, stewed tomatoes. You know, I, I, I went through this whole stuff. So, and what I'm, I'm really serious about this. You know, I'd get a little bump and I'd go, I borrowed that money. I know I have cancer of the chin. So, so you know, write them down. Write them down. You know, my daughter, who's the, who, who you know, you know, she uh, bit somebody at school, and I went to school, and they said, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, and I was like, oh, my God, I've got a Jeffrey Dahmer on my hands. You know, <laughs> worry. What do you do? And, and you know what's the cool thing? Keep a folder. Keep a folder and keep it, because if you want to laugh here, you know what's off. I, I have them back from when 
uh, my daughters were in kindergarten all the way through. And if you really want to laugh, for my kids all went to public schools. So when you go to Atlanta public schools, you really get thick files. But 99.999% of it never happened. So write them down. Create a plan for your worry, too. I was obsessed with being poor. So what I wrote down was I had to do positive affirmations, stayed away from negative people. Um, do you see it brought up every issue in my life? And I thought, hmm, um, you know, I'm this age. And if I wouldn't have handled this worry now, I probably would have organized my life around this fear that I'm going to be poor or that I won't be beautiful and I'm aging and that I'll have this happen or blah, blah, blah. Second, an affirmation. Let's not forget the power of these affirmations, that I am abundant. I am prosperous. I am so blessed. Whatever it is, say it over and over. Guess what? Our neuro neuroscience, I, I'm the spokesperson for electronic arts. One of the biggest blessings of working with this company is I get to work with these researchers studying the brain. And what we know is everything you tell the brain it believes. So if you're worrying all the time or feeling guilty, your brain is just sopping that up and those little dendrites and axions are telling it over and over again. Reverse that when you say, I am joy. I am creativity. I'm not, it's not that I will do it. You have to, you have to, we know that this works, research tells us, I am, not I will, I am. Okay, and then literally think of every cell in your body being joy or being happiness or being alive. So affirmations. Third is gratitude. When you start to worry, and, and you're noticing that you're worried, you're seeing your worry list, and the worries start to pop up, stop it, stamp it out immediately, and be grateful for something in your life. Be grateful for anything. Be grateful that you were on Cobb Parkway and the light turned green, you know? <laughs> be grateful that the person that was crossing the street text messaging that you wanted to hit with your car, you didn't hit him. You know, be grateful for anything. But just be grateful, because what we know, it's physiologically impossible to be grateful and to worry at the same time, okay? So, so just lose your little tips. And the next last is buddy system. Get a buddy, get a friend of yours at work or at home, a neighbor, and say, I worry all the time. And, and you know, um, <laughs> and hope you better, you know, make sure it's somebody you trust. <laughs> um, but anyway, trust somebody and, and tell them and, and, and have a buddy system. Have a cup of coffee once a week and talk about it, okay? So we're all in this together. Um, next, excuses. When I had my uh, radio show in San Francisco and then moved to L.A., uh, and then I kept doing Oprah and, uh, with Oz and Martha Stewart and all this stuff, and, you know, you get the calls. And Jean Chotsky, you remember, she was one of your speakers, and I've been on Jean several times. She's a friend. Um, and, and all these things, I, I, women call, you know, you do your shtick, and Dr. Oz says something. They open the phones. People call in, and it's, I'd love to do that, but my children are in diapers. I'd love to do that, but my husband divorced me. How long ago? I'm sorry. How long have you been divorced? 27 years. You know? I'd love to do that, but you know, since my surgery, I just haven't been right. When was your surgery? 14 years ago. What kind of surgery was it? They had a hangnail on my little toe. I mean, I really mean it. I mean, there's, you know, it's hard for me because, uh, as Allison again knows, I was a hospice chaplain, a chaplain at St. Joseph's Northside and all this stuff, and I'm, I'm addicted to suffering. It's one of my... My many passions, sorry, I grew up Catholic, okay? Um, but I am. And then I studied Buddhism and was a professor of world religions, and we all know the first tenet of noble, uh, the first noble truth of Buddhism is life is suffering. It fit right in with my life. <laughs> so so um, anyway, it's hard for me to have excuses when I've dealt with people, you know, that have a three-year-old with a brain tumor the size of a baseball, you know, my 35-year-old patients that had two little babies with six months to live. So you've got to really think about your excuses. Because these, these excuses literally um, kill your life. Excuses eventually become a belief in a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay? They really, really do. Your success or failure depends on you. Your happiness and your life are your responsibility. Remember what Benjamin Franklin said when he said, he that is good for making excuses is seldom good for anything else. And this is, you can do this in your family. Please do this and with your friends. Say, well, if you hear me saying an excuse like, I want to open my business, but I don't have any money. Or I'd like to, I'd, I'd really like to do this or, or, or buy new clothes or a new car, but I can't do so and so. Please have them call you on it. Have them call you on it. It's the best gift. You're, you all are very young. It's the best gift you can give yourself. Don't be like people that have interesting lives, like a lot of people like my mother and her friends that are now 80 and they sit there in their rocking chairs or sit there walking on the beach in Florida and go, you know, you know, that they, they live their lives 
wondering. I, I, I have to tell you, I, I did this really scary thing that, that, that scared me to death, and I, I broke through the fear and did it. And, and I was being interviewed one time, and somebody said, how could you have the nerve to do that? And I said, you know what I do? I do this meditation. And it's very short. I pretend I'm... I pretend I'm my grandmother. My grandmother did this. She was 90 years old. I pretend that I'm 90 years old, and I have my, gran I have my granddaughter on my lap. And she looks into my white hair, and she goes like this, and she's laying on my pendulous big body, big breast. And I'm sitting there in this squeaking rocking chair, and she goes, Grandma, Grandma, what was the, what was the, the greatest thing you ever did in your life? And I go, you know what? I was scared to death to start my own business. I was terrified because I hung around all these successful people that worked for companies, and I thought, but if I leave my company and start my business, I'll be shamed, embarrassed, we could go poor, and blah, blah, blah. And, she's, and, and I did it. I did start my business, and I did very well. And she said, what's the worst thing you ever did in your life? So then I, sw I swapped the, the guided imagery. And I'm sitting there and rocking her, and she goes, hey, playing with my hair. She said, Granny, what was the worst thing you ever did in your life? Well, what, if you could give me any advice, I'm only 10 years old, what would you tell me? And I said, well, I tell you, that the worst thing I ever did in my life was that I was 35 years old, I wanted to start my own business, I was smart, I had two little girls, and I dreamed about it, but I was afraid, and I never did it. And I'm 90 years old, and I wonder what would have happened, what would have happened if I just would have jumped? What would have happened to my life? But now I'm 90. So I invite all of you to think about that, okay? Because it really is true, and life will speed by you. You know, it's just absolutely amazing. So excuses. And I did this on my radio show. I would tell people, get a white shirt, get those, um, uh, what are those pens that write on things? Sharpies. And write your excuses down. Get up in the morning and write it down. Um, I, I uh, have a zit on my left nostril. I, um, did you know I have a, a club toe? Um, you know, did you know that I act like I have Prada shoes, but they're knockoffs, and I only have $20 in the bank? Whatever it is. Put the shirt on, put it, put it in your mirror, and I'm going to be honest with you. First, you'll get sick of your excuses, and the people that love you will get sick of your excuses, the people at the grocery store, because they're going to see your shirt, your hat, and stuff and go, ooh, that's not really a good excuse. Um, so, or, or that's a really good excuse. And, and, and my point is I did it in a way that you got to stop it. Please, don't do it. Um, it's kind of inheriting a legacy. Also, then finally is fear. Most of us construct lives out of our fears, whether we fear lack of control, our need for status, beauty, money, whatever it is. And I invite you to make a list um, like I did when I left Wall Street. Um, and I listed the top 10 fears of my life because what I had figured was I, I had constructed my life around my fears of not being beautiful, of not being powerful, of not being a perfect mother, perfect wife, looking great, all these ridiculous fear of being alone. Um, all kinds of things. And then I saw all of a sudden, when I, write down your fears, five or ten of them, and, and ask yourself if, you've cons if you have constructed your life around your fears, because most of us do. So um, I invite you then to jump into those. Don't jump in again. Don't jump into every one of them at once. But one at a time, look at it, examine it, talk to your significant other, your partner, a friend, and you may need to get a little counseling on it, a little support, a little help. But once you knock one off, it's amazing how you look at yourself different in the mirror. And when you get out of the shower, that little lump, you know, of, of beautiful, um, greasy fat around your belly, all of a sudden doesn't look so bad. You go, I'm pregnant with a great thought today. <laughs> you know, I'm very creative. That's why that extra inch is on my hip. So, you know, you look at yourself very differently. And, and, and I'm serious about the energy thing that we're discovering. And where's your energy? I want you to observe how everybody treats you differently. It's just amazing. I, I really believe, because um, I've been blessed, blessed, blessed to be around the most amazingly powerful people in the world. And when you look at somebody like Desmond Tutu, you know, Dalai Lama, uh, Nelson, Ma Nelson Mandela after he got out, these people had not a pe They didn't have a penny. Nothing. I mean, I'm talking nothing. Mother Teresa. And, and I'm saying names like that because, but when you're in the power, if you go to ashrams or you go to monasteries, to these really holy people, why do you feel this awe and this power and this love and this amazing energy? What is it? They're, they don't have any money. Most of them have taken vows of poverty. It's something absolutely incredible. And every one of us um, need to know that. This, I, I think this is the greatest opportunity for Americans in the world, the downturn of the economy.
I'm sorry. And, I, and I'm sorry about mortgage crises and everything else, but I think it's a time for every one of us to come together as a human family and really, really examine our values and really be honest with each other and say, you know, you're losing your home, but I'm not. You have an interest note due, which I do, but I don't. It's not. We are one human family. And the destiny that befalls one of us befalls all of us in, in some certain way. Our lives are inextricably woven together. So, so this is an opportunity. We're coming out of about 10, 15 years of total opulence and a lot of money and wealth and, and cons conspicuous consumption. Please, look at every obstacle as an opportunity. I talk about this a lot in my new book. It's just absolutely amazing. It's a time to talk to your kids like you never have before. It's a time that you can talk to your husband. It's a time you can talk to your coworkers or your boss or whatever. So, so think of this as a time of creativity and budding. So now that we talked about the poisons, okay, please, I hope you remember those. Poisons because it's, a, it's an opportunity. Now we're going to talk about how you can actually own your life and own your happiness. First, I want to, I love this quote because I think it's really important. It's the beginning of my second book. And it says, the single greatest threat to our lives is not the terrorists putting poison in the water or pollution in the air. The single greatest threat to our lives really is our lifestyle. And it's something uh, that's in our face, I think, every day these days. Um, what we know is stress is the epidemic of the 21st century. We have um, every single day these studies are being funded more and more and more. And the sad news is we women experience much more stress than men. I know that's a shocker, right? Um, that men are able to detach and leave, thing, leave things and we don't. The good news is we handle stress in a very healthy way, lots of us, because we learn to do it through relationships, which is a very easy way we're going to talk about to de-stress. Um, why is stress different today? Stress is different today because we have 24-hour news. We have um, an overload of information. We have uh, environmental stresses. We live in urban societies. We don't watch sunrises and sunsets. We're not tied to the cycles that we do. because So there's a disorientation almost within all of us. Um, also, we know that people that feel in control are less stressed. People that feel out of control are more stressed. So if you take the events of the last 10 years, whether it's 9-11, you can add that, where we totally changed our paradigm, changed, listened to all the change things I talked about, technology, science, kids trying to kill their teacher, eight years old, everything else, you can see that our brains um, are really, really struggling to survive. So um, I started out a long time ago. Um, I'm not going to go into because a lot of you were here last year. I won't go into a long bio. but. Um, I started out in the world of finance in, at the 104th floor of the World Trade Center. And then I tried to manage kids, a husband, a life. And um, I kept getting more stressed and more stressed. And I come from a family of alcoholics. And, um, and I used to go to parties. Has anybody seen Wall Street with Michael Douglas? You know, that's an older show. It was worse than that. It was really an unbelievable place. And, um, and I would go to these parties and see these things. And I would go, my God. And these were people that were just immensely wealthy. And I'd go, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be here. I don't. But I didn't know what to do. So what I did was started losing weight, drank, and, and really um, kind of started having a meltdown. And what happened was mind-body medicine was emerging with Bill Moyer and the healing in the mind, Herb Benson at Harvard, Dean Ornish. And I started seeing it, and I thought, you know what? Um, this was my first life, and I love finance and da-da-da-da. But what I think I want to do is this mind-body thing is really fascinating. I'm only 35, and you know what? Am I going to take drugs for the rest of my life? Am I going to struggle with Johnny Walker Black for the rest of my life? This stress on our marriage is so bad. Am I really going to be able to sustain this marriage or my kids? That you, you do all know, have you ever screamed? No. Or have you ever been stressed out and look at the face of your children? I went, my God, do you know the suffering I'm creating in their life? So what I decided to do was go into it and actually I made a critical choice to fall in love with stress and depression and walk right in the midst of it and walk right down through the, um, right, right in the depths of it. I don't suggest that for everybody. Remember, I'm addicted to suffering. <laughs> don't go. Um, but so what I did was I took the long way. I uh, did venture capital for a while, bought and sold companies, and then I sold everything and got hundreds of acres in the North Georgia mountains, literally lived in a cabin like Thoreau, and um, chopped wood, carried water, 
no electricity, no power, no nothing. And I let all, everything I was afraid of and everything and melt down and all that. And I did that for a long time. Um, what changed my life was Thoreau's quote. I saw in a book when I, when I was um, in New York, and I think it, it goes something like this. I went to the woods to live deliberately, to confront the essential facts of life, to learn what it had to teach so that when I died, I would know that I had lived. And when I read it, I started crying because I thought, what if I die today? You know, um, if I really lived, if I really, really, really lived. So that's what sent me on my odyssey. So that, that just short story about where I came from. And then I decided my right leg was very spiritual and I'm profoundly fascinated by souls and, and psychology and emotional well-being. And I'm totally fascinated with science, totally obsessed with science. So um, I spent all those years, you know, four years at Emory, four years at Columbia, and Years and years and years, I lived with tribes. I was fascinated with Aboriginal tribes and Indian tribes to study that if every one of you walked into Harvard Symptom Reduction Clinic or you walked into the Hopi Shaman or you went to the Athabascan Clinic or wherever you went, how would they treat you differently? And do they use 1,000-year-old or 2,000-year-old technology? Do they use MRIs? So I was fascinated with all the diagnosis and how could I accumulate that? And how could I sponge it up? So what I did was built, eventually went back up, couldn't find a place to teach what I'd learned, started the Stress Institute, built a facility up there, started bringing AIDS patients, cancer patients, women with metastatic breast cancer, children with brain tumors and their families, brought everybody up there. And it was amazing. It was an odyssey for many, many years. We grew, wrote my first book, came down here. We have a corporate office here. And then, then everything kind of just took off. Um, Tremendously, but this has been. I, I want you to know that it's not just. It's not just something I did and it popped up. It came out of my own wounding and my own um, almost death of my life um, from from stress. I mean, you can't sit there and have two perfectly beautiful children, a husband who's an amazing physician, have every single thing in the world, and wake up every morning and before you brush your teeth try to contemplate. Hmm. I wonder what it's like to commit suicide. I wonder if I really want to live. I wonder if I'm. And I really mean it. it, it, it my, mine was a very difficult, which I would never wish on anybody. But my point is, I don't want any of you to have to spiral to that level. So that's why my life is about helping people with lifestyle so that they can accommodate and make changes before they have to spiral to the depth that I did. So I'm not going to talk about my training and stuff because she already did that. So let's talk about some simple facts about stress. Um, we now know that Harvard reports 90% of all Visits to primary care physicians are stress-related. Um, the Dalai Lama was recently at Emory, um, and he had an eight-hour day, a whole day he devoted to depression and stress. And so there were many of us there, but he was on the stage like this with some of the, the, the utmost researchers in stress and depression in the world from the NIH, CDC, you name it. And it was really fascinating. All day long, they talk about stress and depression. And you've seen him with lights and wears his little visor and he sits there with his little bare feet. Didn't say much all day long. They talked and talked, and they were talking about implants, and they were talking about all this heavy-duty stuff. And finally, at the, almost at the end, the, the, this amazing moderator, MD, PhD at the NIH, looks and he goes, Dalai Lama, he said, Your Holiness, you haven't said much all day. He said, What do you think of this statistic that the clinical depression, the onset of clinical depression in 1960 was 55 years old, okay, 1960, the clinical onset, uh, onset, excuse me, of clinical depression was 55 years old. And at the end of 2007, just a couple months ago, the average onset of clinical depression in North America is 24 years old. It's pretty amazing, guys, because also that's de clinical depression and stress is the driver of depression. So, um, and, and that the World Health Organization said it's the number one disability in the world. What do you think of that? The Dalai Lama looks and he just smiles. He just smiles. He looks, he goes, ah, oh. he said, well, do you really want me to know? He said, it's not going to be very scientific. And so everybody kind of smiled and he went. He said, I wake up every day knowing I'm imperfect. He said, I am, um, you know, I'm flawed. I'm imperfect. I forget things. Um, you know, I'm just a mess. And he said, so I'm pretty happy. He said, I've accepted myself as a mess and imperfect and, you know, make all kinds of goof-ups all day long. He said, so I don't have much stress. It was very interesting. He said, my expectations of myself are not very high. Isn't this interesting? He, and we're all laughing. It's His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. 
And we're so everybody's laughing, and then all of a sudden he got very quiet, and he went, um, the, the definition of stress to me is the difference between here and here. And this is who I am and home with myself, my imperfect human self who I love and respect with all of its flaws. And these are my expectations. He said, so the distance from here to here is the, is the amount of my stress. He looked at the audience and he said, so I'm asking everyone, and now you can imagine who the audience was filled with, all these brilliant people. He goes, so I'm asking everyone, all of you big lofty people that think you have all these brains, oh, if you're stressed, oh, just take your expectations home. And he sat there and smiled and he went like this and he sat back down. I sat there and I thought, why did I spend all those years studying this crap? All I needed was the 12-inch theory. You know, I mean, leave it to him. And, and I think that's a powerful illustration for all of you, and it's something to teach your children, too. We live in a world where we project on our children from the time they're born, oh, he scored this on a test. Oh, I mean, I was with somebody yesterday. Oh, my child, he took his test, and he was at the top. He, he was like, out of 50 kids, he was number one. And I went, really? What grade is he in? He's three. He's in preschool. I went, um... We've got to realize, and this is great with the Dalai Lama. I, I happen to be able to talk to him once I'm, I'm going on with this, but I want to tell you what I, what I did. I was like, oh, my God, you know, I'm so worried about my daughter, and my younger daughter has some significant problems. I said, da 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 blah, 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 blah. And then the older daughter, blah, 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 and I go on and on. He starts laughing. He looks at me. He goes, oh, you're so funny. And I said, what's so funny? And he said, why do you women think that these children are yours and that your ego is their ego, and if they look great and they're beautiful and perfect and they become this and that, it's all you and and then if they become an alcoholic or, or jump off a bridge or whatever they do, it's all you. And then you blame each other and you get in your car and drive home and go, oh, did you see Phyllis? Her son's a drunk. Ooh, Phyllis is bad. He started laughing. And he started laughing. He said, you are so funny. And I'm sitting there like this because he was saying everything, <laughs> you know, in, in, in my world that was happening. And, and he laughed and he went, you know what? He said, let me tell you. He said, these children are of you, but they are not yours. He said, these souls, these perfect, beautiful souls come into this world to learn a lesson, and they are divine. They're holy. They're not yours. And they come through you, and you do your best, but life is suffering. And their power in their, in their cultivation, the power in their divinity, is that they have to make those choices. How dare you judge yourself by their choices? It's their soul. It's their life. You gave them the best you could. And so do not judge yourself by the suffering of your child. It could be an ancient soul that came through here to, to have an unbelievable experience. So have joy in your heart. When you know you've done your best, bless them, love them, and be there for them in their suffering. Don't take it as an ego thing because then you get screwed up. And he just bowed and walked away. And I went, huh, that's a different take than my mom told me. So I wanted to throw that in because I think some of you have a few kids. Um, I want to tell you about something else that, that I just heard at a medical meeting I was at last week. The Journal of the American, this shocked me, the Journal of the American Medical Association reported in that October issue, stress is as bad for your health, listen to this, equally as bad for your health and as much of a risk factor as smoking and high cholesterol or high cholesterol. Isn't that amazing? Stress. It's just amazing. Recent research done with American women across America, all of North America, they reported their top five stressors. And see if you believe that this is true. I do. Number one, their top stressor is a lack of work-life balance with companies and them get, trying to get them to realize, you know, child care, help me, flex time. That was number one. Number two, perfectionism. Isn't that interesting? Think about it. We are always judging each other and judging ourselves against each other. It's one of the biggest things I wish women, if I could, uh, with, along with the excuse hats and the excuse shirts, I would love for people to say, stamp out perfectionism. It has caused more eating disorders, more hate, more divisiveness. You know, so-and-so walks in and she wears a size 16, and when she walks out of the bathroom, people start whispering. Yet the one who comes in that wears a size 0 or a size 2 walks out and they go, hmm. Did you see that gray hair in the back of her head? Or, hmm, she looks like she's getting anorexic to me. So, so we're, we're just terrible. So, so let's go and leave this conference today and stomp, you know, stamp out perfectionism and talking about each other. Let's have compassion. You don't know what I've been through. 
I don't know what you've been through. The one thing about counseling people and living in the bowels of hell and suffering, um, which I've jumped into for so many years, you do not know the steps another human beings walk through. You absolutely don't know. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. I went to a meeting and this man sat next to me and I really didn't like him very much and he was a doctor and he was acting pretty nasty and, and blah, blah, blah. And so I was like judging him and we were sitting beside each other at a conference like right like you two are and, and I was trying to be nice and I kept thinking, ooh, I just don't like this guy. And blah, blah, blah. And I went to the bathroom and I was doing all my little spiritual exercises trying to be all lovey and changing my chakras and, you know, all my little spiritual stuff. And I sat back down and I went, ooh, I still don't like this guy. So... <laughs> So I, I, and I had to be three days with him. So, so I started, I'd go over there and sit, and I'd go over there and sit, and he would sit there. And it was just so cool. I felt so cool. I was like, God, I'm avoiding him. Last day of the conference, I go to the book thing to go buy a book. I'm sitting there by the bookstore, and this hand comes over and touches me, and it's the guy, and I went, oh, my God. And he looked at me, and he said, um, where did you, sur how did you survive? Where did you, what did you survive? And I looked at him, and he scared me to death. And I went, What? He said, us, the people of us that have survived these, um, these, um, what, is these what did he call it, prison camps, torture chambers. And I looked at him and I went, I haven't been in a prison camp. I, I haven't been in a torture chamber. And he looked at me and he looked into my eyes. He said, that's why you couldn't look at me. He said, because like knows like. And, he's, and, and he said, that's why you couldn't touch me. And he said, I want you to know I prayed for you for the last three days. And he walked off. Well, how do you think I felt? I was like freaked out. So I had to do a, a post-conference and meet and lunch with this bunch of women. You would have loved them. You would have loved them. And so we're sitting there talking, and they go, did you see that strange-looking man from Central America with the blah, blah? And I went, yeah, I saw him. And she said, you know, I was in a room. I was in a session with him, and he told the most unbelievable story. He was very pro-American, you know, in Central America, blah, 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 very, very amazing physician, very well-known. One night they kidnapped his wife and children and kidnapped him. And he sat there and watched them rape and kill his wife, torture his children. They kept him for two years and wetted him in t waterboarding. You know what, just a horrible, torturous life. He said he opened up his shirt and showed us the scars. Now, how do you think I felt? I, I went, oh, my God. And what I realized a week later was what he was telling me was I wasn't in a Sandinista thing. But I did live in a very, 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 very afflictive childhood. And he saw it. He, he saw it in whatever energy force that I had. And the reason that I'm telling you this, and I think it's so important, please don't judge other people. We sit here in a world of conservative and liberal, and we hate each other. We listen to talk radio. We do all these things, and it's important to you because you all have businesses. You're going to want to have businesses. You're going to work in corporations. What's the first thing we do? We judge each other. Don't. Everybody has a story. And let me tell you something. You don't know what their story is. So when we leave here today, owning your life, own your happiness, the minute you shift everything to compassion and you walk out of here with a decision, I'm going to be the most compassionate person in this world I know. And you know what? I'm going to teach my children, and I'm going to teach my coworkers, and I'm going to be a light in this world. We'll, we'll all go out of here, each one of us, and we will change the world in a new way. It's really, really, really important. This last year of my life has really changed in, the, in these people. But this man changed my life because I'm doing so much media, and Allison knows this. You can get with some pretty crusty and get, you know, we're, we're in the middle of a big negotiating deal with Martha Stewart right now. Um, she wants to co-brand, and it's, it's a very big deal, um, considering buying our brand and a bunch of other stuff. And, and I know you guys know this, and doing with Harpo, and these, it can be pretty, this media group is tough. It's a tough group. And, and, and he changed my life in that, that the moment that I start to judge someone or, or go, da, 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 I'll never forget his face. So all I'm asking you is whatever you do in your life, let that blow you forward into a new you instead of an angry or fearful you that pulls you back. Okay, perfectionism. You know what the next one is? Isn't this sad? The need to be thin. It's number three. It's a number three stressor. It rated one of the highest. It's, it's, it's crazy. We've got to stop it, guys. Okay? Average thing is, is, is size 12, and some of us are thinner. Some of us are... Uh, skinnier, some of us aren't. Stop it. Your gene pool designates a lot of that. Your stress response it goes back 30, 50, 100,000 years. So if your stress response is, if you have like I do, my grandmother was very big, big, huge, and, and, and my DNA and my stress response is when we get stressed, we hold on to weight and I can't lose it. My breasts, my belly, my blah, 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 I just hold on to it. 
Some people, when they're stressed, as you all know, they get skinny, thin. You know what I mean? They're shedders, I call it. So, so don't, and we hate all those people. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so here we go with the compassion thing again. See, so, so it's in your DNA. And let me tell you, those of you who, uh, us, us who are the, you know, the holders, that you wouldn't be sitting here today without those ancestors 30, 50, 100,000 years ago. So that when you can't tighten your belt or your, your, you know, if you put a new blouse on it, it opens a little bit here. Not that that ever happens to anybody here. Or, or, or you put something on and your husband puts his arm around you and gets a hold of this thing right here. Um, what I've learned to do in this positive affirmation thing is I always smile and I think Orla. Her name was Orla, my grandmother. Poor hard-working, amazing woman. God bless her soul. I thank her because without these hard-working women back thousands and thousands of years that when, when famine came, disease, back, black plagues, their weight kept us alive. You are the highest expression of your gene pool. You are the gift. You wouldn't be here without all that. So be thankful when you feel these little things and these little things and all that kind of stuff. Just be thankful. Guilt. We talked about guilt. And this is interesting, number five. I never would have guessed this. They consider infertility as a life crisis. Isn't that interesting? That was number five or across the board. So I wanted to tell you that. Um, we've got a little bit left, um, I think about uh, seven minutes. So let me run through some things you can do for yourself. One is there is a science of happiness. We now know that you live longer, you have less cardiovascular disease, less infection, hypertension, if you practice happiness. 50% is in your gene pool. 50% of your happiness depends on your environment. People like myself or other people that have had a very difficult environment, or even if you had a great childhood, but your parents didn't handle stress well. I have a friend who had like this perfect childhood with these perfect parents, but the mother, every time she got stressed or angry, she was an introvert, she went in and withdrew from the family. So. I almost said her name. So this person does the same thing. My point is look at your environment, see how they handled it, because you're handling your stress probably the same way. What we know now is we have so much science on how you can handle stress that, um, that um, you don't have to live your life out that way. You do not have to live with the legacy of your, of your parents and grandparents and the way they handle stress. Um, I, I know you all know this, so I'm not going to spend much time. Stress um, prematurely ages you. We now have very strong science. Do you know that it actually shrinks your brain? We, we age sooner than we thought we did now. I thought it was when I got to 50 and my gray hair and the stretch marks and my cesarean section sc scars that I thought were going to go away. I didn't know that they, they turned these wonderful colors as you get older. Um, heads up for all you section and hysterectomy people. Um, but I love every one of them. I tell people it's the story of your life. The scars are the story of your life. Um, my daughter the other day I had something on and she saw this scar. And um, she said, are you going to have that taken off? I said, no. I said, do you remember that scar? And she said, yes. She said, that's where you had that tumor removed. And we talked about it. And we cried and we held each other. What we have to realize, the scars are the stories of our lives. We're women. You don't have to take everything off. Um, just so belongs on the canvases when you're painting, not on your body. Uh, stress takes a toll on the way you look. I'm amazed at all the women that get plastic surgery and do all this other stuff, but they drink lots of alcohol, smoke, eat crappy food. What we know is it starts organically on the inside. You want to look younger? Um, really, I'm 85 years old. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> begin with what you eat and what you drink and how you think. Um, stress makes us fat again. It, we, we're holders. Um, we're too stressed for sex. I did WSB radio yesterday, and that was hilarious. That's a whole other story. It was about sexual dysfunction and stress. Um, the studies all show, by the way, when women are stressed, we don't want sex. Do you want to know how it affects men? We know, don't we? And, 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 the, and the interviewer was trying to be real cute and went, Oh, Dr. Hall, I'm so shocked. I said, Get over it, Ruth. You knew that. They want it no matter where it is or how it is. Um, stress is a silent killer. It exhausts your immune system. That's why we're talking about cancer in the relationship with stress. Um, you, um, depression, you have a 70% higher death rate from heart disease if you have clinical depression. It hurts your memory. And um, here in Atlanta, by the way, uh, I don't have time to talk about it right now, but stress in the commute, women are much more affected by the commute. Uh, we have uh, Agna Scott did the original research here in Atlanta. Our cortisol levels go through the roof. Men usually stay the same. Your body's your best pharmacy. It's your first line of attack. We have 100,000 chemical reactions in your brain every second. So what I want you to remember, too, is that when you think of yourself as chemical soup, a lot of us cook, 
think of every thought, every emotion that you have is like, is like a vegetable soup, adding carrots or, or butter beans or salt or pepper. That everything you think, everything you do, every reaction you have changes your chemical soup. You're constantly changing. Even though I look solid right now or you look solid, you're not. You're changing every single second. So that's an incredible opportunity. So very quickly, uh, um, I want to use two acronyms that I hope you remember as we leave. Um, this is in my first book, and it's called ACE, Ace Your Life. And A is for awareness. You cannot handle your stress or your depression or whatever you're dealing with without awareness. So I ask you, and a lot of you are finance and accounting, do it like a credit and debit, minus for the debit, um, plus for the credit. And on the credit side, put things you love. What do you love? Do you love holding your baby? Do you love gardening? Do you love a warm bath? What do you love? What do you love? Do you love listening to certain music? Do you love uh, doing a spreadsheet? <laughs> Watch out for those. Anyway, um, whatever you love, put it on the plus. Um, on the minus, put what irritates you. Events, people, holidays. Seriously, write them down. Do it for about a week. Have everybody in your family do it. What we know, I just did something with somebody. Um, and I can't remember if it was Ladies Home Journal or something. It was a really good article on um, children mirroring their stress. Your children will mirror your stress, by the way. So if you're doing all this stuff, trying to get your kids the right car, the right school, the right everything, and you're stressed out, i got news for you. Not only are they living in a more stressed world, they're inheriting your stress. So the biggest gift you can give them is to talk about stress and create, teach them how to be stress resilient. Teach them it's like lifting weights and getting stronger and eating right and doing all those things. You, we must talk to our kids about how to become stress resilient. So awareness, second is choice. That's the C part, that we have choices. Then once you do that, those two things, talk with your spouse, talk with your family and say, you know, I really hate going to Thanksgiving. For some reason I get, you know, diarrhea. I still think after 20 years my mother-in-law is trying to poison me. Whatever's going on. You know, it's the way she looks at me when she puts that certain concoction. Um, but talk about it. And then E is, is the energy that will come from your experience, meaning you're going to see once you start making, I'd say baby steps, make little choices and you'll change. Okay, so that's A-C-E. The next I want you to remember is self-care. That's in the second book, S-E-L-F care. And these are four um, roots, okay? And don't forget, self-care, S-E-L-F. You can remember that. I developed the acronym so that women could remember self-care. The thing to remember is, like a glass, you fill it up with water. I want you to, to give out of an overflow, not out of a, an emptiness. So you have to fill yourself up first. S is serenity. And some quick choices in serenity every day to do for five minutes is um, if you're really stressed, count to four and breathe. One, two, three, four, like this. Hold it for two seconds. Out your mouth with you're in traffic. What it does, repositions re, uh, the brain, uh, dendrites, axions, changes the uh, chemistry in your stomach, everything. One, two, three, four, inhale, blah, blah, before a phone call if you're anxious at work. Another thing to do that's very, very simple, again, the affirmation. Memorize a positive affirmation. No matter what happens, you know, the call at 2 o'clock in the morning. A lot of you, I think you guys are pretty young. You haven't had those yet. Oh, excuse me. You'll probably never have one. <laughs> Just wait. Um, and, and then what you do is you memorize a positive affirmation. I'm in balance. Um, there's a purpose for everything. Whatever it is, if you have to believe it yourself. Third, very easily in S, is guided imagery. Memorize a place that you love. If you're a beach person, smell the salt water. You know, see the dolphins, um, hear the seagulls, feel the salt on your body. All five senses. If you're a mountain person, really embellish it. Memorize that thought. So then when you're in turbulence on a plane, anything happens here. If you see somebody that um, is a stressor for you, if you're at Thanksgiving, whatever happens, you can take a deep breath, and you're not there. You're at the beach, you're at the mountains. We know that the brain actually changes. We have real-time ways we look at the brain. Memorize the guided imagery. Gratitude, please. Whenever you're stressed, it's physiologically impossible to be stressed and gratitude, grateful at the same time. And I ask people, when you're commuting in Atlanta, when you're driving your carpool, everybody needs to do a gratitude scan. You start at the top of your head, the bottom of your feet, and my God, that body has been working for you since conception. So you thank that brain and you thank those eyes. What we know in the new research, every cell of your body has intelligence. So what do you think that little liver and that little stomach's doing? They're going, huh, I worked for this chick my whole life and she's never thanked me once. So all of a sudden you, when you start thanking your stomach and your heart and your colon, that little colon baby, it's working all the time. So um, yeah, 
by the way, did you know you expel um, 1,000 pounds of feces a year? I thought that was a cool statistic. I've got other cool statistics. I don't have time to say them, but that's pretty cool. I'm married to a gastroenterologist, and he didn't know it, so he was like in awe for a week, like, whoa. Um, laughter. Um, take time during your busy day to laugh. And if there's nothing to laugh at, <laughs> just laugh at yourself. But what we know is it increases your artery diameter by 22%. We're actually using it with chemo patients, and we're doing it with people with autoimmune diseases. Keep flowers around you. We have a new Harvard research. shows that people that are around flowers three days, they have more feelings of compassion, um, does away with depression and anxiety. So um, next is E. Well, let's talk about very quickly. E is exercise. We know, and again, we don't have time for all the data, 50% reduction in cancer risk if you just walk three times a week. And so think of new ways. Rent or buy a Tai Chi Chi Gong tape, a yoga tape. Learn it. Desk exercise is what we're calling it. When you're at your desk during the day, memorize five yoga positions and do it. Keep a five-pound weight under your desk. And again, if you don't get along with your boss, it looks suspicious walking in with a five-pound weight. <laughs> so you might want to keep a five-pound book, bookend, or something else It's not so increases your bone density, gets your heart rate going. Sing, go online, sing, see a joke. We're calling these, in the Harvard Business uh, Review, they call it renewal rituals. And they've got good science. They're doing it with Sony, Ernst Young. All these people are doing what I'm saying right now, really science-backed. Get your family exercising. Put a badminton court up in the back, you know, in the grass. Um, get, put up a basketball hoop. They still laugh at the way I can't play basketball. And the other thing, especially with exercise, please learn to play. Children play. Men never quit playing. ESPN, hello. March Madness, what's going on here? We women stop playing. What we know about play, again, electronic arts has taught me a lot. Do you know that when you play, your brain totally changes? Everything in the chemistry of your body changes? So that's E. L is love, S-E-L. On your text, on your um, email, on your quick dial, always keep three people that you love. When you're stressed, what we know is if I'm stressed and I can text Allison or email her or call her real quick and going, you know, I think I'm going to do whatever, that what we know is it produces oxytocin. It's a connection hormone, especially women have. Estrogen actually exacerbates it. So we know that we're, we need connection. If you're working, make sure once a week you organize a group that you go out to lunch together so you can laugh, oxytocin, eat healthy food and come back. Try to get the restaurant 10 minutes away. 10-minute walk there, 10-minute back. I call it stress-reducing lunch once a week. If you're at home and you're not, organize a group to walk once a week. Um, get a group to, to do study spirituality, study health, study mysteries. I don't care what you do. The science is strong that if you just meet once a week for one hour, your health outcomes are phenomenally better. And teach your children about this too, please, because they really need to have friends. And last is um, food. Um, and, and very quickly, just my, a couple of my favorite foods. Uh, everybody should be doing omega-3 fatty acids. Um, one of the questions I used to get, uh, are, are the capsules, are they the same as eating fish? And we just have a new study that shows, yes, we did serum tests on people and found out that if you take capsules as opposed to eating fresh fish, it's the same serum level in you. So I suggest, you know, at least two grams a day. If you're taking medication, talk to your doctor. We have got so much science, guys. Our brain is fat. Our brain cells are covered with fat. Omega-3 fatty acid with the stress we're living under, every one of us. We're showing it with breast cancer con uh, prevention, heart disease. Everybody needs to take fish very, very seriously. And uh, next is, is broccoli. Every person, especially women, need to be taking broccoli. Johns Hopkins found a compound in broccoli that prevents the development of tumors by 60%. And people that already had cancer tumors, it, um, it uh, reduced their size by 75%. Do not, if you don't like broccoli, I could care less. You're going to eat broccoli. <laughs> Take your salads, and how to do it is I did this with my husband. He hates broccoli. I chopped it really, really fine, and he'd start eating going, what's that? And I said, it's a new herb we found. <laughs> I, I was up north, and they found this herb really, really small. Then as I got brave after a year, I got him a little bigger, and he got a little suspicious. Huh, what's that? So, you know, my point is, is, where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> and, um, and finally, the other one is uh, blueberries. Um, we call it brain food. Do you know that Tufts University showed that blueberries slow in reverse uh, many degenerative diseases associated with aging? It helps your memory, every one of us. Again, blueberries are expensive. You can go to those uh, discount places and buy them in big bags, buy them frozen. And when you use them, put them in a paper plate flat, put them in for, for 20 second intervals, and they'll be like they're fresh. Okay, so uh, um, I, I know the expense, but you really have to start eating them. And finally, tea. 
Um, great tea studies. Every, did you know every leaf of tea has 4,000 compounds? Is that not just a, like a miracle? So we're looking at it, prevention of breast cancer, cardiovascular disease, longevity, and uh, especially green tea, but black tea is great too. And again, I will close on um, my husband's from South Georgia, and uh, so five years ago I tried to get him to drink green tea because I was with at MD Anderson with one of the biggest green tea researchers in the world, and I came back and had all this data, and, and he was like, I'm from South Georgia. We do not drink green tea. And I said, but why? The science is showing this and that. And he said, you know, funny things happen when you drink green tea. And I said, Jim, you're a scientist. Like, what funny things? He said, you know, when you're from South Georgia, you just know funny things happen when you drink green tea. <laughs> so um, it was, science was so compelling. Here, fast forward five years, he and I just left a, a meeting up at Tufts and Harvard this year and blah, blah, blah. We come home. He's like pouty, nasty. He says, you're the lifestyle expert. And I said, yeah. And he said, you should have made me drink green tea. He said, now we know the science. You knew it five years ago. You should have made me drink it. And I looked at him and I said, really? And he said, yes. And I said, sugar, I've been half and half in your tea for five years. <laughs> and you didn't even know it. And his face turned bright red and he said, you're kidding. And I said, no. And I said, so even in your ignorance, I still tried to save your life. Please make choices. Please claim and own your happiness. And as God bless Allison and Maria, own your life because you are the only person can, that can create the dignity and the power to own this sacred life you've been given. Thank you very much.